Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to the talk today. Uh, myself and April, we're gonna be talking about uh, the AI chat integration that we did on Yale sites. Um, we did decide our original idea was to make deep fakes of ourselves so that we could just hit play and sit right here and while they gave the presentation, but we decided that that was a disservice to you, so we're here in person. So uh, today we've got three people. We've got Franz Hartl. Um, he is our uh, basically the leader of the show. Um, we have uh, April today. Uh, what is your what's your title? UX. I forget. UX. She is a UX UX designer. Analyst. US, UX analyst. All right. I don't remember my own title. My apologies, April. Uh, and so my name is Randy Ost. I work at Four Kitchens, and this is a project that we worked on. Um, so, one of the things that I want to talk about first is to acknowledge that the metaphor that I'm using during this talk, I actually wrote when I gave this talk at mid-camp, and it's going to look like I'm ripping off Dree's note. I did not rip off Dree's note, because I am also using a space metaphor. So, I love the Cold War, so the space race where like Russia and the United States were all like kind of fighting for dominance, trying to gain priority. So the Cold War, just as a reminder, was 1947 until 1991, uh, and that's when the U.S. and Russia were bitter rivals. I mean, we still are, but you know, we're talking about the Cold War. These two superpowers had an ideological and geopolitical struggle for global influence. And the space race was one of the most significant, significant ways in which they competed with one another. So to achieve the impossible mission of getting people into space, each side had to be inventive and had to be focused. So the US and Russia both wanted to be the first person to put, or the first country to put a person on the moon. So John F. Kennedy, who is kind of like known for all of his work with NASA, originally wanted to scuttle it. He did not like it as an expense. He wanted to remove it as president. Um, however, we had, uh, we had an issue, and that issue was the Russians put the first person in space in a single 108-minute orbit. And so that was kind of like the Russians teeing up the competitive like nature, and the United States answered the call. So. Uh, in fact, this embarrassed the United States and lit a fire in President John F. Kennedy, who immediately asked for congressional support of the space program in a speech titled, Special Message for Urgent National Needs. Now, believe it or not, I will get back to AI at some point. I just really want to make sure everyone like gets drilled into them, the space program metaphor that this year's DrupalCon has. So... Um, we do, uh, I work in Four Kitchens, and we do a lot of work with our partners at Yale, and we've spent the last two to three years creating the latest version of Yale Sites, and we're going to talk a little bit about Yale Sites in a little bit and how that powers AI. Um, so Yale Sites, uh, let's see, it runs hundreds of websites at Yale. It is amazing and warrants its own talk. In fact, we're going to provide a link to you to a talk at Drupal Camp, New Jersey, so that you can find out more about that fantastic project. Uh, project. So during one of our regular check-ins between the Yale team and the Four Kitchens team, our contact at Yale, Franz, uh, told us that he needs Yale sites to be a leader in AI. He said, everyone is playing with AI, everyone at Yale is playing with AI, and every school, every department, and every website at Yale is exploring what AI can do for them. So we got the speech, special message on urgent AI needs for Yale. And um, so our launch date was five weeks from that conversation. Go. So um, this was Four Kitchen's first AI project. Um, the folks at Yale had a proof of concept chat interface that was running on Azure OpenAI Studio and duct tape. Uh, we had a short timeline. And we had a lot of budget and smart people, both from Four Kitchens and from Yale's wor Yale, working on this problem. April? Yeah, so this, the timing of this AI project couldn't have been better for us. So as Randy mentioned, we r recently rolled out the new Drupal Yale site platform. And this, you know, this platform, the goal of it was to have site builders of the Yale community be able to easily create beautiful sites to communicate their, out their information. What better way to enhance this experience than provide an opportunity for real conversations? 
right? This UX strategy of communication just kind of fell into piece, it fell into place to piece these two projects together. So if you're, as Randy mentioned, this is a, a, a QR code that goes to our talk that we did in McCamp uh, in uh, New Jersey. So unlike the Yale site project, which was a multi-year build and planning, right? Yale sites was a quick turnaround. So planning is easy when you don't have time for it, right? <laughs> we yeah. tried to make it as simple as possible by just kind of really asking two questions, resourcing and requirements. So how many people did we need and can get to put on this, right? So back-end engineers, need them, love them. So we got one engineer from Four Kitchens, three from Yale, all to focus on Azure AI um, and the back-end. We had another back-end engineer just for the Drupal stuff. And then we had a front-end JavaScript engineer and a designer for the chat interface. We had a content strategist for uh, prompt engineering, planning, and the promo language around the landing page and communication materials. Then we had three testers, one which was a UX designer, which was me, and a creative director. So it was really kind of hand, like a good amount of hands on deck for the short turnaround time. And about those requirements, well, the AI chat needed a home, right, for people to learn and visit it, learn about it and visit it. So we needed a website. Then the chat needed a personality and, of course, data, right? This all came, so the data came from the Yale Hospitality Drupal website. Um, we reached out to them and this was gonna be our first kind of um, prototype launch um, for the Yale Hospitality site. So, and then last, we, need, we needed to make sure this was gonna be compatible. We needed a way for, to be able to drop this into any Drupal site that is running on the Yale Sites platform. So with that, we did have a lot of critical decisions around the chat's responses, right? Accuracy, appropriate tone, formatting, length of answers, aligning to the user's intent, and intent um, providing a sense of transparency and trustworthiness are only some of the topics that we were talking about every day through and through. So let's dive a little more into it. You guessed it, content. Right? The, quality of, the quality of your source content significantly impacts the quality of the chat responses. High quality content ensures information retrieved will be accurate and reliable. Well organized, relevant, um, content, contextual rich, con rich content allows the system to select the most appropriate pieces of information while responding. Um, so Yale has a rich history of being content first, um, you know, and with the Yale site Drupal system, uh, platform, we really did this content first. So that was a huge benefit for the project. So here we're going to examine what it means to optimize content, right? So you'll see, and this is the same information, one and presented in two ways. We restructured the version on the right to remove redundancy and group related details under headings and provided valuable context, context to the audience so they can quickly identify important information, like deadlines. By using bullet points, we make it easier for users to scan and engage with the content as a whole. If we tested the two versions, right, a user, uh, with users, chances are they would prefer the optimized one on the right. Okay, so everything from your content sources, you know, to the questions, to the responses sent inside of the chat interface is measured by tokens, okay? If you've come to any of my talks before, I talk about design tokens a lot. I am not talking about design tokens today. I'm talking about tokens as they relate to AI. It's a reuse of the same word. Um, and basically, while some words map to a single token, others might require multiple tokens. Okay, uh, so if you can look in the demonstrated example, this is OpenAI's tokenizer. You can actually visit it, you can enter your content and see how AI sees the content that you have. And what some people don't realize is that AI can only use a certain number of tokens during interactions. 
Um, this is referred to as the token limit and is one of the reasons we need to use a concise and well-formatted system prompt. You know, it is, the system prompt is sent along with every request, adding to our overall token usage. So the content that you just saw a moment ago, how we managed to streamline it, get it down in size, make it more concise, easier for humans and robots to read, that also reduces the, our token size and gives us more room to provide meta prompts that help um, frame the responses that we get from AI. So when we run these two versions through Tokenizer, we can see immediately the impact that optimization has had on our content. We've reduced our token count by 44% and the character count by 46%. So this means that good, strong content makes your AI better, more reliable, and also less costly because you're paying for fewer tokens um, that go into the queries. So let's talk about data. All right, this is a terrible joke, but I had to include it. What I really wanna talk about is, is real data, not Star Trek data. We can talk about that later. So when the project started, um, what we were doing with Yale Hospitality, Yale has a rich history of content-rich sites. The Yale Hospitality site was still on Drupal 7. So what we were doing is we were scraping the Yale Hospitality site and inserting that into a vectorized database. Um, Yale Hospitality, as a data source, presented two complications to us. First, that the site was still on Drupal 7. Um, they have a lot of complicated functionality, and so we're in the process of getting them migrated to the latest version of Yale sites. Um, but that's, that requires some custom work. And then the second part of the challenge was that the website is more than just Drupal data. Um, their menus operate on a separate system and they have a fair amount of catering information that's also in PDF format. So we had a lot of challenges whenever it came to the data of the website. So that's why when we were doing this five week mission, we could have done it right and tried to get the data out and miss the deadline, or we could you know, kind of bootstrap ourselves and scrape the data and use what we could do. Uh, so we spent a lot of time working on this challenge. And ultimately when we launched, the data was still being scraped because of uh, two new complications that arose when dealing with the data, which was uh, prompt engineering and ethics. So as we were putting together our messaging for this site, uh, we came up with some questions that needed to be answered because in addition to the technical things that we needed to do, you know, we had a Yale community that was going to respond to it. We were going to have a Drupal community that responded to it and a greater community at large. So what was done with the information that a person types into the AI interface? How does the system respond when a person types a question uh, that the system should not respond to, such as suicidal ideations? How should it respond to that? What happens if a person tries to trick the system into doing something it's not supposed to do? So we had several calls with representatives from Microsoft to get answers to these questions. Azure OpenAI Studio has controls for these and you can customize responses in your code. So data retention of what user types can be um, sent, set by the admin. Um, Microsoft has a content filtering policy. So the content filtering models um, for hate, sexual, violence, and self-harm categories um, and has been specifically trained and tested on a bunch of languages, English, German, Japanese, Spanish, French, Italian, Portuguese, and Chinese. And defending against hackers trying to trick the interface ties into another issue, which is prompt engineering. So prompt engineering uh, it is the process of structuring text that can be interpreted and understood by a generative AI model. If you've played with ChatGPT, you go in and you have entered in your prompt because that's your question and then it answers it. That's why a lot of times you'll see a lot of advice like give it additional context. Tell it it's a UX content writer and tell it why you're writing it and feed it a bunch of data and that additional context provides better answers. That's what we're doing here with the prompt engineering for ask.yale.edu. So, um, in more simple terms, a prompt is natural language text describing an AI's task. So, we encountered several challenges. How can we prevent people from hacking the AI? Prompts are not deterministic, so you may get wildly different results from the same prompt. Poorly structured content was causing the system to return wrong results to prompts. Or, you know, uh, um, sorry. 
Uh, getting the voice and tone to have a personality was also a fun challenge on this project. We wanted it to, um, to love Handsome Dan, the, the dog mascot for Yale, and we wanted it to be a big fan of New Haven Pizza, which if you've not had New Haven Pizza, come and see me. I will tell you why it will be your favorite pizza. <laughs> So to combat against these problems with what your AI could potentially generate, you have to do some red teaming, okay? And so um, what red teaming is, is it is a structured testing effort to find flaws and vulnerability in an AI system. Now, that's the definition that I'm using here. There's still a little bit of, you know, some conversations about what does red teaming really mean. Um, but basically what you're trying to do is put on your black hat and see what you're able to, to break or what bad information you can get and fix it. So, in fact, this term red teaming uh, itself was popularized during the Cold War, back to that theme, uh, and began to be formally integrated into war planning efforts by the U.S. Defense Department. In simulation exercises, so-called red teams were tasked with acting as the Soviet adversary, hence the term red. Uh, while blue teams were tax tasked with acting as the United States or its allies. So as information security efforts matured over the years, cyber the cybersecurity community has adopted some of the same language, applying the concept of red teaming to security testing for traditional software systems. So red teaming generative AI is an entire talk into itself. Uh, the short version is that we challenged our team to try and exploit the AI. Um, the web chefs at Four Kitchens are good people, so it was nice to get to wear our black hats on a project. It was a lot of fun. Um, consistency and randomness in responses um, comes from a variable called temperature. So this has a value from zero to one, and higher values like 0.8 make the output a little bit more crazy, a little bit more random, while lower values like 0.2 make it more focused and a little bit more deterministic. Um, if content is challenging for a person to read, it's also difficult for AI. I know I said that before, but I kind of want to beat that drum again. And we discovered this when asking about vegan food and the AI told us about chicken nuggets. The content, yeah. The, the content that we were putting in had a, a long, deep paragraph that referenced chicken nuggets and vegan food, and so the AI thought that they were related. And so once we started going through the content and making changes, we were able to get more reliable results. Like, we were actually able to ask for vegan food and not get recommended chicken nuggets. Chicken nuggets, despite what my daughter says, is not vegetarian or vegan. So... Um, you want to use headings and lists to organize content, um, and you want to remove old and outdated content. Anything that's on your site, if you decide to scrape it or pull it in, that information is going into the training library, and so don't either don't import it into the training library that you're using for AI, or better yet, just remove it from your site, because if it's not doing you any good, just get rid of it, thank it, and say goodbye. So, all of this is going on. Uh, we've got all of our engineers working on these, like this AI stuff and scraping the website and pulling in data and getting all of this stuff done. Well, what about the interface? Okay. So um, we determined that given the timeline that we had, building something from scratch was right out. We did not have time for that. So we were going to steal, I'm sorry, borrow from somewhere else. Um, Microsoft um, has uh, a repository called Azure Chat Solution Accelerator powered by Azure OpenAI Service. Sorry, I had to read that slow because it's corporate speak. So it, it, what it is, is it is a React chatbot with all the basic functionality built into it. And this is great because remember how I said we had a front-end JavaScript, or how April said we had a front-end JavaScript engineer on the project? Sort of? Um, we had a great front-end engineer with some React experience, and we had myself, who builds many React projects and apps for tabletop role-playing games on the weekends. And so the first question that we had is, how are we going to put this React app into Drupal? Um, we got an answer to that question on week four. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, we had theory, but we didn't have anything working till week four. Um, the answer was a custom block. So we used the custom block on the page to insert the React app and have everything fire up. 
Um, for the interface, we had uh, debated two different design directions. Did we want to have a full screen takeover or a chat-like pop-up? Like if you've ever seen those little interfaces in the lower right-hand corner, if you want to talk to someone like that, um, those were kind of the two major directions that we could have gone. And I lobbied for and won getting a full screen takeover. And I, I did that for two reasons. Um, first, I wanted the experience of the Ask Yale interface to be a custom brand experience so that people could get used to the idea of sites having this um, and I also wanted to avoid the multiple overlay problem so like what happens if a site um, a Yale site already has a customer service chatbot or some sort of promotional chatbot there or a cookie banner or an, an email sign up for email interstitial I wanted to put something that was going to not interfere with that and stack on top of all of that so April off to you so Randy mentioned a little bit about red team testing, but I just wanted to kind of zoom out on that and rethink and look at testing again, because as a UX designer and interested in AI, I was brought in for testing. So really, how do you test something with open-end testing scenarios? A user can ask anything. And from a functional per perspective, how do you test something that can produce different results every time? So overall, testing AI requires flexibility, um, adaptability, and willingness to embrace uncertainty. Unlike traditional software testing, where outcomes are predictable and static, AI testing requires continuous evaluation and adaptation. So we were able to hold, sneak in in that short turnaround time, a few user testing sessions, which gave great insight to us to see how the users are really gonna use it. We interviewed a couple students and shadowed them using it, and even watched them have fun with the chat. Um, so, and we're gonna continue doing, we're continuing this effort and keeping up with user testing with the chats. Another level of testing that we discovered, which is that red team testing, right? We couldn't just test what the desired or predictable or you know, high priority questions we think that users are gonna ask or we want them to ask. We also have to ask those questions that they shouldn't probably ask or might not, right? So, um, so that adds a whole nother level of uncertainty and effort. Um, so a big shout out and thanks to Fort Kitchens because since we've launched this as scale, we've already made huge progress with developing a custom testing approach that is focused around the content and the content uh, experts. So this is a huge effort. So be before we launch ASCIO on anything, we have workshops and presentations to really assign that content to a s expert. They are own that content. They test it. They write, they make sure that it's they're responsible for it. This is a huge jump. Even past the AI, this is amazing just for content on your site. All right, so we come to launch day. We had five weeks, and whenever the date came, we were ready and we launched Ask Yale on time. We landed a person on the moon. The United States beat Russia. It was fantastic. So now, to be honest, when I say that we were ready, what I mean is we had a great product to show off and several weeks of refinement left to do. Um, so... <laughs> In my history, I used to work at an advertising agency, and one of the things that I learned at the agency is that whenever you have models who are showing off clothes, the reason that the clothes fit so perfectly is that there are actually clips in the back where they're tightening the shirts and so that they look good in the photographs, but behind them are these giant clips kind of holding everything in place. And so when we launched, we had some giant clips on our back, but that's okay. <laughs> Like, you know, um, but we spent the next couple of weeks like ironing that out so that there weren't any problems and that's okay. So, you, okay, so you're gonna give a demo. Yep. And so let me pop open, yep. um, ask Yale. You're gonna have to forgive me for a moment, everyone, as I switch to built-in mirroring. Here, ask. Do, do, do. All yours. So now we're gonna demo it, right? This is the um, landing page for it. We did go with the big takeover screen. 
And then, you know, I'm going to say I need vegan pizza. And we have a response. It tells me that I can get vegetable red pizza and where it's at. And it even gives me a smiley face at the end, right? It looks simple, right? But it's actually pretty complex. But I do want to highlight a few features, and I have a slide for it, but I'll show you here, is we have these citations. This was huge because it really showed where, like a transparency of where this information is coming from. This helped us for testing. This helps give a transparent and trustworthy feel to the, to the, um, to the chat experience. Right? And now I can look here, I can even click on this and it takes me to the actual source and website page. This completes that experience. You know, they're not left with, should I trust this? Can I trust it? Right? It's an assistant that kind of points the user in the right direction and then they can kind of choose where they're going, going to go from there. Um, and I, as I mentioned, the minimalist design is really huge. All right, let's see if I can get this back to presentation mode. Um, while we do that, I would like to thank Askiel for not telling me about chicken nuggets <laughs> during that response. So let's see. In theory, oh my goodness, it worked. Wow. That's crazy. All right, continue. Oh, so yeah. did you go over all yeah, this? Yeah. Oh, I, the one thing I wanted to mention is notice the, so this is kind of another response, right? And you can even see, um, it's a different question, but you can see that in this response, it puts the answers in bullets, right? This was a formatting decision that we actually put in there whenever possible, split up the response in short, concise, put those bullets in there, put those steps in there. So you're not just dumping a huge paragraph of text. Who wants to read that? Not me. So, you know, having it broken up and be scannable just really helped take that experience, you know, a little further. Um, and then, as I mentioned, that the simplicity of it is the beauty of it. You know, it looks like, oh, a simple chat, but so much went behind it, and it, that kind of, you know, is it the simplicity, there's beauty in that simplicity. So, one thing that I absolutely loved, because I'll be honest, this whole AI stuff, I was like, I don't know. At first, I wasn't on board. And I was like, okay, but it's here, and it's going to come fast. So I had to get on board, right? But one thing this project have really opened my eyes up to is that by adding this technology in and by optimizing the website, you are improving the experience of everything, building the sites, you organizing your site data, and the user experience, right? So just, and, and it also contributes to search engine optimization, improves on-site search. It also reinforces website accessibility best practices. So, you know, even if a user never uses the chat and hates AI, they're getting a better experience because of it without even knowing it. Yeah, I just want, I want to echo that. So the benefits of the space race, once again, returning to my metaphor, was numerous and continues to impact our lives today. So like things like artificial limbs, scratch resistant lenses, firefighting equipment, dust busters, LASIK, shock absorbers for buildings, solar cells, water filtration, invisible braces, and free dried foods like astronaut ice cream. Um, and just like the space race, this project gave us and Yale many benefits. The, the content optimization for, for AI has improved human readability of the site. It has improved search engine optimization. It improves the on-site search results. And it reinforces web accessibility best practices. Um, as part of this project, Yale has created a Drupal module to empower Drupal websites with AI capabilities. Um, it facilitates the transformation of Drupal's data into a language model, like a large language model, an LLM. Um, it facilitates the creation of embeddings from Drupal content and metadata, enabling efficient content management and transformation into a vector database. Additionally, it offers a question and answer chat service for public views. Right now, that is on the, the Yale site's GitHub. Um, and it is called AI Engine, so you can do a search for it and find it. It is not up on Drupal.org yet, unless that's changed. 
Nope. All right. Okay. What's that? Okay. All right. Okay. Great. Okay. So. Um, this also helped define our prompt engineering practice, um, which is benefiting our content strategy practice as well as we integrate AI tools into our deliverables for clients. Um, and the excellence around having an AI interface has accelerated adoption of the new version of Yale Sites, which itself raises the bar on the quality of content and accessibility at Yale. So. Yeah, so to think, like, what we have achieved in such a short time is just the beginning. You know, with AI, we're entering a realm of possibilities where innovation knows no bounds. So every challenge is an opportunity to learn, grow, and create something. Together, we have the power to shape the future of AI and re redefine what's possible. Thank you. And we left a lot of time for questions. April, do you want to, April, do you want to MC and pull out people for questions since you're standing at the podium, or do you want me to do that? Uh, any questions? Yes. <laughs> okay, we have a lot. So, okay, I'll go from the left. Hi. Uh, My left. From the University of Kentucky, um, uh, my, I guess, first question is going to be, um, what is the, the, the next step, the scalability? Uh, you've got the hospitality information, but I know our deans are going to immediately ask, okay, where's our student services? We yeah. are doing it. We are so, adding it. So the, so, the bo so the bottleneck is not the technology. So the technology is actually kind of is 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 is, is pretty a rag based architecture is 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 well established. If it's not this, it's going to be something else, right? Where all the thing is is going to be on the content. You're going to you're going to be wanting to slow it down because you're going to be getting answers from the retrieved arguments that are just are inappropriate, are not there, your content isn't up there. So what you really have to start getting in place is you have to start getting in place data governance, you have to start thinking about like, it's content, 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 and that's why I think where we are with Drupal is in, is in such prime position because we're, what we, because we have that there. So if you have a, if you have a Drupal, if you have a Drupal 10 site, you know, you could you could take in and you could take that module, we'll look into better distributions, but it's on the Yale Sites GitHub, and, and you can get that and you can have everything to get into the vector database, but what you don't have is you don't have an organization, you don't have the training in place the, uh, to kind of make sure that people could do the right, right reviews because the, what, what AI is about is, is about reliability and trustworthiness and that is only gonna come through really solid QA human practices and that you have a distributed subject matter experts. So when, you, when your provost comes in and says, <clears throat> you know, where is this? Can you just roll it out? You, you're going to have to go through a whole training and say you need to be rethinking this. It's not a turn on thing like we do with some other IT things. This is a new thing that we're going to have to like manage change and manage an implementation on. <clears throat> To follow that though, we have been able to spin up test environments that is not public, that we hand to them and say, work yeah. on your content. Yeah. And we've been doing, like I said, big shout out to Fort Kitchens, we have those workshops to work through that content, assign those yeah. experts, get it to answer it right, and test it. Right. So, so we're, we're doing, so there's the, some, some of the big wins that we're doing it right now is we're doing it with some of our, like our health benefits, like people always have medical, we're, we're, we're entering that system in universities have policies and procedures. I don't know if you've heard that it's been in the news, um, <laughs> you know, but how, but they're kind of opaque. Right. And so we're looking at that and, 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 and making that stuff available, but we haven't been able to kind of really kind of roll that out like super publicly. And even this ask Yale now is behind CAS is because we really need to get like we really need when we when we roll these stuff out you, you if, if you don't want to fall on your face here you don't want to kind of have like a scandal or say something there so you want to be really kind of make sure that it's trustworthy but we're we're getting we're getting there and we should um we sh we if you if you if you go to yale sites that yell that you and follow there you'll see a lot of our training we we're gonna we're gonna put our videos and we're gonna put our training materials we'll make all of this stuff available to you in the open source community so you could kind of leverage the materials that we're we're coming through and we're going to be paying attention to what you and the community are doing and and and, and do it like we do with drupal and just kind of all work together 
Yes, in the back with the uh, orange lantern. Uh, how did you encourage the content authors to go back and optimize their thoughts? When the answers come back wrong and it's terrible? Yeah. It's, it's really, I mean, it's, it's like, it's Honestly, like, that's, we, that's we the answer. Yeah, like. No, it's they, no, it, they're, no. They come, they come to us. No, they come to us, and they go, "Why? I'm the person in charge. Why is this person like? Why does it say this is the boss here?" And you're like, "Well, did you update your website? Like, like it's the information. We're pulling the information from your website that that's wrong. So you need you need to kind of figure it out. Look, people. So this is the Drupal community. This is a con content level, right? Like marketing level thing." You, you, you've always had a hard conversation telling your client saying, hey, your content is terrible. Like, and it's like, no, I, I understand this. And it's like, no. And it's now you have this third party, this AI, this intelligence. And it's like, why is it spitting out garbage here? Why is this slop? And it's like, oh, it's slop because your content is terrible. Like, so you got to go in there and you got to optimize it and you got to change it. So it, it, it's, it's that, that has, it really hasn't been the problem. Really, it's the people like this is again what April was saying is like this has had this all these kind of fringe like extra benefits, like like when people when you when you sync up and your your content is the repository for your AI engine and for the conversation, it, it, like like people are like oh I really want to improve the website on my con uh, like I really want to improve my website now I really want to kind of make this because this is a new kind of this is like the biggest leap since the GUI right so here we like at least right it's probably it's bigger than that but it, people just do it people make things better the short version is that vegans are being told about chicken McNuggets <laughs> so yeah. yeah in the back with the beard Uh, uh, we often we often get confused with projects that come from our friends in Cambridge, but no, it's it's not. Um, it's the no. This is this is the, Yale sites. It's a little bit more like like Stanford sites, like Columbia sites. Um, it's it's more of an up, upstream Drupal distribution. You could go. You could again look at look at the GitHub there. It's. Um, yeah, it's it's like an upstream model with Pantheon, where it's all single. It's not a multi-site thing. It's all kind of everybody. Everything is, is on its own container, and the allow it, it again. Like it's like one of the philosophies. I think one of the benefits in like everything coming together is is that we've made these decisions to kind of containerize and like kind of like like nodal structures and, and pushing things out to the edges of a network, like all these philosophies. And when you do all that and you do it properly, everything kind of comes in and swings in really well for a project like this. We don't have a mechanism. So what we're, do what we're doing here right now is for people who are more technical, we're doing kind of naive rag. But like, we're, like what we're doing is, is if you have a strong content management system in place like we do with the L sites, that's going to be the making the aggregation of all the different information easier because we're going to be able to kind of do kind of subject matter experts content on the end. We're going to be able to do kind of taxonomy generation in there. It's AI is just going to open up everything. Thing. So, uh, how do you see evolve speak about the, the budget that the incoming Graphon Black and Fox is seeing as their part? No, at the agile, so we're running three five. So the so the, the so the costs, so the benefit, so the co like LLM is going to come into a commodity, and the benefits that we're getting from like GPT three five, we're not even on. F we need to go to four there, but we're, where, where the issue isn't 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 the cost. Where the issue that you hit is is kind of inference speed is there and is like kind of compute. So it's like kind of, can I have dedicated compute that I know is like, like essentially we need service, we need service li serverless inference. And um, that's, that's been the barrier. The cost really for running 3.5 at this on something like this is negligible because you could get, come on, like WhatsApp has, Th like f f level four level quality now. Insta has it all. Like uh, your cost is not that high. The now the cost for training is different, but we're not doing training. We're doing rag. Yes. Uh, 
that's Randy's that's, Randy's that, that's on me. So um, the we got a lot of it out of the box. Um, Microsoft provided that chat interface, um, and it was it was really great. It had a lot of good functionality. Um, we did have to go in and tweak it just a little bit, but most of our changes were presentational. So just you know applying my designer preferences to things. Um, as far as like getting the citations, getting the information, all of that data was was pretty well handled out of the box from that that open source project from Microsoft. So it was really nice to to have that paired with the Azure AI stuff that we were doing that made spinning this up a lot, it reduced the amount of effort that we had because we had fewer things to focus on whenever it came to the user interface. We, we, the, citations, the citations become very important and we place them at the top because it's again going back to the idea of trustworthy and reliability, right? Like so the big knock on AI like is, oh, it hallucinates, it confabulates and we wanted to be able to kind of show like how the retrieval arguments and what documents it's, it's pulling from. It also kind of helps again where you're getting bad responses and then you have like a kind of way of kind of, it makes it easier for kind of um, continuous in, uh, uh, improvement on your content because you're like, oh, this answer is bad. Um, that doesn't mean you need to change your prompt necessarily, but uh, look, where is it pulling it from? It's pulling from here. It's there, or the other. The other thing is, is that why? Why wasn't the result? Why wasn't the result um, appearing? Like, there's here's this other document that's really great for it, and wh where is that? And it's like, oh, this is actually a search engine optimization problem. This is kind of, uh, you know, like a, this is a retrieval thing. How do we better seed it? How do we do a hybrid? So I think I think the Drupal, like I think as a Drupal community, we do need to have like a kind of. We, 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 it's part of our stack is we have something beyond, beyond SQL that we have, we're all going to have to start thinking about and it's going to be these kind of these vector databases that we're going to have to kind of start start making decisions about about what what, what what's the best option and what 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 systems that we should do there so we're retrieving the right answers. It's 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 a whole new it's a whole new it's, it's a whole new information architecture because why are you going to go through like it like especially like so I look I've been in Drupal for a while I love working in universities because I think universities present the hardest web questions possible from an information architecture perception because you have all these different audiences and you have all these different things like a university is doing so many different things right so how do you kind of like begin to do wayfinding on this because AI and search is really about wayfinding and navigating through the whole process, right? So yeah, it's gonna have to be. It's it's it. This is like this is like saying like w w we need to have like res like you, you you expect your your website to be responsive, right? Like you don't you don't like you, you know you, we're gonna have the same thing. We're gonna have to have it. Is it this or is it anything? I don't know. It, I, I, I I'm not sure there, but it is gonna be like. A first rate thing, yeah. Yes, in the front here. So, content is obviously the thing that's going to drive for this conference. And assuming content is good, how, as a university, where a lot of the information is like heavily relied upon by a lot of different people, and you look to build this as a more public thing, as opposed to using it as like potential hallucinations and kind of monitoring. So you, so what the strategy is is that you have to look at you. you we don't make the, we don't make the. the uh, so I'm going to put it like an IT hat on. Like that's not my, that's not my decision to make, right? I we need to have like like we do with cybersecurity is we have a shared responsibility model with cybersecurity. We say like, look, look how much risk are we are you willing to take on this? Like are you can vouch for this? We we're going to have to do we we have to do the same thing that we had and. Um, you know, the woman who's sitting next to you, Sebastiana, she, she, she came up with like a kind of a really good kind of series of kind of workshops that helped us find what are the real kind of questions that we need to be asking, where, where is the danger, because I'm not going to find the danger, right? So we, we're doing this for the health, I mentioned with the health benefit plans, like things that I wasn't thinking about that we found danger on, right? Like we found danger, we found danger on somebody asking about death benefits 
of uh, their spouse. And then the response was like, there was no empathy. And it's just like, uh, somebody just told you that their husband died and the bot is just like, fill out this form. And it's like, <laughs> no, but, I, and there was no way that I wasn't gonna think about that, but that was something that like the subject matter expert at the end. So like, I think what, how, we're, how we're gonna have to do it is the only way that we're gonna scale is, is if we push this out. So for people who are in universities, I think, and I'm gonna, I will go out this, I think that, that this is the stake. If you, if you had a central control model where the only people, the only thing that could ever get published on your website is like stuff that goes through this massive approval process that like we have one office that controls everything, that you, you're going to get smoked. You're not gonna be able to keep, keep up with your peers. You, we need to move to kind of, and, and Drupal's very good at this, moving to a distributed model where people at the edge who are subject matter experts who are closer to, who are closer to the content are empowered to do that. Another big thing that changes from the content game is that in, in, and this is for people who are in marketing, previously with everything we've done with content has been based upon the idea of scannability. We have erred on the side of saying people do not read and, and therefore we have to be concise and we have to have that. That is a bad formula for AI that we've discovered because the AI needs granularity. The AI could kind of consume and could read very quickly and read completely. The AI could do needle in a haystack thing. So if you're gonna find the needle in the haystack, you need to give the whole haystack. So this is also gonna be a big change in what we do for content. We're going to be writing a lot more in depth and our websites are gonna get a lot bigger. Yes, we have one more question, time for one. Mm -hmm. Not that, oh, go on. Yeah, so we do have a survey, um, and, you know, um, like I mentioned, we do some user testing. Um, so, and on the AI website, you know, we can have the survey. Besides that, right now, I don't know about any metrics on usage, but um, the feedback, we haven't gotten negative, so that's a plus. We, we, and what we have gotten has been pretty good, you know. Uh, like p users tend to like to have fun with it. Who doesn't? Sa stakeholders, stakeholders in the administrations uh, has been th that's been the real big thing right now. It hasn't been we haven't been pushing out for a big rollout for like an adoption kind of thing, because again I, I think we're, we're concerned about reputational risk about bad answers. So we, it's been a very much a soft launch. I think this is like the most I've talked about this like there. Um, but what, but administrators are very uh, administrators are very understanding because a large like. Yale's been around since 1701. We have some bureaucracy, right? And anything that like kind of saying like, hey, this is gonna help me navigate, this is gonna help me wayfind through it. Yeah, like, we're, so we, we, have a, we have a real backlog, but we're, we're going a little bit slowly to go back to the original question, and it's not a technology issue. What Four Kitchens has built out was super sound. What it is, is, is it's the people, it's the content, it's that's, that's, that, that's, the, that's the drag, that's been the limit on, on adoption. Okay, uh, I, do we have time for one yeah, more? Yeah, why not? Yeah, okay, last one. Could you repeat the question? So we, we, so we, 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 we cut up everything with, you know, we, we, we cut up everything, we cleaned everything up with beautiful soup. One of the, well, let me make a plug for accessibility right now. Accessibility, we've been, we've been obsessed with accessibility. Accessibility has kind of really kind of minimized our, 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 ch our chunk size there. What, we've, what we went in, we started with like a 600 to 800 token size chunk, but we, we ended up just kind of going and saying, look, the context windows are blowing up. So like, and if we're only gonna do five, like I'm not afraid of three or 4,000 there. Um, we're doing kind of overlap, but I'm happy to talk to you about like more like kind of like, the, yeah. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you.